Well, as I've said this evening, we're going to finish this paragraph that we were looking at this morning in John chapter 14. And what I'd like to do is simply read the six verses, uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. But this evening, we're going to be focusing on verses uh, 4 through 6, uh, primarily verse 6, because that's where the substance is of uh, those three verses. But this is what our Lord Jesus Christ again said to His disciples in order to comfort them. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this evening. Now again, as I mentioned this morning, Jesus, we saw him comforting his uh, disciples uh, because he had told them that his departure was near. And again, as we're going to see, we need to understand that we perhaps see this a bit differently than, than they saw it because we have the Bible to explain to us as they will learn a little bit later exactly where it was that Jesus was going. But Jesus told them, one of you, one of his own, were going to betray him. Uh, Peter would deny him. He was about to go somewhere where they could not and they would uh, then be left alone. Now, obviously, that would be troubling to the disciples because throughout these last three and a half years, Jesus has been with them. He's cared for them. He's protected them. He's taught them. He's provided for them. They have a big job ahead of them, and Jesus isn't going to be there. But in spite of all this, he told them not to be troubled, not to be fearful, not to be anxious, not to worry. Why? He says, because his father was in control. His father had a plan plan was perfect, and everything was going exactly as He intended, because Jesus is trustworthy. He was about to do what was necessary to open the door of heaven for everyone who would believe in Him, including them, and of course, including us. And again, we'll see in just a moment, it may not have been entirely clear to them what Jesus was talking about. And because after He left, Jesus says He was going to return for them when their work was complete and He was going to bring them into His Father's house, uh, where, as we saw this morning, He would love and cherish them as His bride forever, bringing His bride into His Father's house, which is the Jewish understanding of a marriage. That's, he was going to marry them. He uses that, um, that figure very often to explain our relationship, uh, our relationship to Him, His relationship to us. Now, here's where the interesting part comes in. Having said that, Jesus now makes a statement that, that looks like it was calculated to test His disciples to see if they understood what He had been talking about, what He had been teaching them for the last three and a half years. And that comes in verse 4. He says, "...and you know the way where I am going." In other words, you know the path that leads to my destination. You know where I'm going, you know how to get there. Now, after all this time, you think they would have known, but apparently they didn't. At least it appears they didn't understand what Jesus was saying the way that we understand what Jesus was saying, at least at this particular point. We know they did, of course, later. Uh, at least they didn't understand it. If what Thomas said here was really reflecting what the whole group believed. In verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? If, if we don't know where you're going, then how can we know the path we're supposed to take to get to where you are? 
Now, again, this is Thomas, the one who will later say, unless I see the nail prints, you know, in his hands, unless I stick my finger in them, unless I put my hand inside, I will not believe. Perhaps this was just Thomas, you know, reflecting the particular struggles he had. But nobody else seemed to ask questions like, Thomas, you know, where have you been the last three and a half years? So I think they just didn't understand, okay, that Jesus was speaking about heaven. And of course, not knowing where he was going, they didn't know how to get there. Now, what they couldn't quite grasp, Jesus now tells them plainly in verse 6. He says, Jesus said to, the, to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus was going to the Father. That's where he was going. The Father is in heaven. They should have understood that by now. And Jesus is the way. Now, this is what we want to consider this evening. First of all, Jesus tells us that He is the way. And I'll tell you, when you think about all the different things that could possibly mean, uh, it's true at many different levels. Uh, Jesus certainly is our prophet, the one that God sent into the world to reveal the Father, to reveal His truth, and to show us the way. Jesus has taught us through His, through his teaching, through His prophetic office, the only way to heaven. Now, you know, it might surprise us that the only way to get to heaven ultimately is by living a perfect life. Remember on one occasion, I think it was he said to the rich young ruler, do this and you will live. Now, he said that to the rich young ruler that he had to basically live a perfect life because he was challenging him. He wanted to convict him. He wanted to show him that he couldn't live a perfect life. Nobody from Adam all the way to the present, has lived a perfect life except for Jesus Christ alone. Jesus then taught that the only way to heaven ultimately is through the gospel. It can't be through our obedience, which we're going to look at a little bit further at the end. It has to be through His work. God gave His Son so that He might do what was necessary in order to open the way to heaven. Now again, we're going to keep seeing that as a recurring theme this evening. Now, Jesus not only taught us the way to heaven, but He also showed us that way. Uh, if ultimately the way to get to heaven is by living a perfect life, Jesus was the one who lived that perfect life. He gave us a perfect living example of how to get to heaven. But again, of course, we know we can't follow that example perfectly. We need to trust Him. And yet, that example is still how we are to seek to live, having trusted in Him. What kind of a life did Jesus live? Well, he lived a life that was of complete trust in his Father and complete submission to his will. Jesus trusted that his Father was going to do what he promised he was going to do, and so Jesus set his heart to do what his Father called him to do. That is the example that he left us, and that, of course, is the path that leads to heaven. Now, both of these things are true about Jesus with regard to telling us the way and showing us the way. But we need to understand that what Jesus has in mind here is actually a more intimate application of this phrase, the way, to Himself. In that He not only teaches us and shows us, but He Himself is in fact the way. The gospel is all about Jesus and about salvation in Him. He is the one, Jesus is telling us, that the Father chose to send into the world to obey for us. I mean, we can't obey the, 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 the law. We can't obey God's commandments well enough, as I've already mentioned. So we need one who could. Jesus came to satisfy that requirement, to make sure that the condition of entering into heaven was met for us if we would only trust in Him. And in doing this, He becomes the way. He is the one the Father appointed as a sacrifice, the one who would take the penalty for our sins upon Himself and on the cross, fully discharge them on our behalf. This is how He becomes the way for us. He is the one who would rise again from the dead and enter into heaven itself for us, as we saw this morning, through His own blood not through the sacrifice of animals, not through any sacrifices that anyone might want to make, but through the only sacrifice that the Father will actually accept, the only one that will actually pay 
for sin. So He is the way, and it's only through faith in Him that we can receive the blessings that God has actually promised in what we call the covenant of grace, which is God's purpose to show mercy and to give to sinners that which they do not deserve if they will only trust in His Son. Forgiveness, He will forgive all of our sins. Eternal life, which is not just a duration of life, but a quality of life, a relationship with the Father. Entrance into heaven, as we saw Jesus said this morning, I have prepared a place for you. And of course, an eternal inheritance we get because we're joined with Christ, we become heirs also of the same kingdom that the Father is going to give to Him in the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is the way. Now, secondly, Jesus tells us that He is the truth. Now, as we just saw, as a prophet, He is the one who comes down and speaks to us <clears throat> the truth, who gives us the truth of God, who declares to us the only way we can enter into heaven which is through Him. And of course, in, in this office as a prophet, <clears throat> He spoke the truth and was true to His office as a prophet. He was also true to His office as a priest in that He offered a sacrifice that took away our sins. And let's not forget, as a priest, He also stands before the Father continually pleading what He has done on our behalf so that we will make it to heaven. And of course, He is true as our King. Uh, there has never been a more faithful and righteous King than the Lord Jesus Christ, one who rules in truth. But again, Jesus means more than this. Jesus is the truth. Now, this is, this is very interesting, isn't it? Because this is what everyone is seeking for, at least they say they are. But very few seem to find it in Jesus Christ, but that is exactly what He is. Now, Jesus Christ, uh, well, actually, through the, through the Apostle John, who wrote this Gospel of John, reminds us at the very beginning of His Gospel that Jesus is the Word of God. He is the truth that comes from God. It was His Spirit, or by His Spirit, that He gave His people truth in the Old Testament, and He is the one who came in time to reveal that truth perfectly in Himself. In other words, the whole Bible is about Him because He is the fulfillment of it all. He is the truth or the substance or the reality behind everything that God has shown us, behind the types in the Old Testament, which were all pictures of Christ, and the shadows, what we call the types and shadows, the promises that God made, and these prophecies. Jesus fulfills all these things. He is the truth. But one other thing kind of struck me as I was thinking about the fact that, that He is the truth, and that is that ultimately He is the truth behind everything, everything we see, everything we hear, everything we taste, everything we touch, existence itself, Jesus is the truth behind it. He is the reason for it. And the reason why it kind of struck me is because I've been listening to a tape series by R.C. Sproul called The Consequence of Ideas which is basically an overview of the history of philosophy. And you know, when you look at the history of philosophy, the thing that the philosophers were doing from the very beginning to the present day is that they were seeking to know truth. They wanted to know ultimate truth. They wanted to know what is behind everything that they see. What is its essence? What is its substance? What is its purpose? How did it come about? How did it come into being? Why is it here? What's going to happen to it? And another very interesting question, which is, what is right and what is wrong? You know, the question of ethics and so forth. But you know, Jesus is the answer to all of those questions. He's the one who created everything. He spoke and everything came into being. He is the one who essentially holds everything up in existence. I mean, what is the reason why things exist? Well, it exists because the Lord created it and because He holds it up and keeps it in existence by His own infinite power. Uh, why does it exist? Well, He created all of these things to reveal His glory, to show us what He is like, uh, especially as we've seen uh, at the cross of Christ, the glory of His justice, 
and the glory of His holiness as well as that of His grace. I mean, Jesus was nailed to a cross. He had to die for sinners because God is just and He could not overlook sin. The cross reminds us of the justice and holiness of God. But because Jesus was not dying for Himself, but for all who would trust in Him, it revealed God's infinite grace and mercy towards sinners. That is why everything exists, was that God might display who He is to us, that we might, well, that we might glorify Him, that we might honor Him, that we might give Him credit, that we might love Him, that we might trust Him, that we might serve Him. Now, again, as we think about the history of philosophy, these are things that Paul recognizes in Scripture that man in his wisdom was not able to discover through his own wisdom, but it's something that God revealed to us through the gospel. He writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 25, and we, we should listen to this carefully because this, again, shows us what the world thinks of the truth versus what they conceive of as the truth. He says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased to the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Uh, think about Paul at the Areopagus on Mars Hill, preaching to these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who were seeking wisdom through, again, their own wisdom, as it were, trying to understand all things. Paul comes and he tells them the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, but to them it was foolishness. But not to all of them. There was a few that believed and that followed the Lord Jesus Christ. They discovered the truth. God revealed it to them. So Jesus is the truth. He is the answer to all the ultimate questions that, that we might have to ask, and particularly those that have to do with us. Where did we come from? Well, He created us. Why are we here? We exist for His glory. Where are we going? Well, that's an interesting question. We're going to heaven if we trust the Lord Jesus, but we're going to hell if we don't not because we haven't trusted Jesus. Ultimately, we go there because we have sinned against God. And the only way to be forgiven is by trusting in Jesus. So Jesus is the way to God. And He is the truth behind all things. He is the ultimate truth. Now, thirdly, Jesus tells us that He is the life. We know that He is, as we've seen, the creator of all physical life. Contrary to what scientists believe, Life is not a property that is inherent in matter. If you organize matter, it doesn't just become alive. As a matter of fact, um, nothing is alive apart from the Spirit of God. It's been pointed out that you know, when a person dies, you still have a lot of organized matter in that body that's still there immediately after death. But for some reason, it's no longer alive. Even though it's organized, it starts to decompose. And the reason is because that which makes it alive leaves. And that is, of course, the soul, the spirit that makes it alive. That's something that God gives, and it's something God takes away in His time. There is an appointed time to be born. There is an appointed time to die. The psalmist writes in Psalm 104, verses 29 through 30, You hide your face, talking about from His creation, they, your creatures, are dismayed. You take away their spirit. They expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit. They are created. And you renew the face 
of the ground. Jesus is the author of physical life. He is what makes everything live. He's also the author of spiritual life. As we've seen, he's the one who came to obey. He's the one who came to die that he might give his spirit not only to create physical life, but to make us spiritually alive so that we might love him, so that we might trust in him. And he is the giver of eternal life, as we've seen. He's the one who can forgive sins. He's the one who brings us into a relationship with God. He is the one who gives us a title to his eternal kingdom. But again, he's more than that. Jesus is life itself. He is the life by which we live. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Basically, Jesus is, is that very principle of life in our souls that makes us alive spiritually, that turns on the lights, that makes us love him, follow him, and serve him. And of course, he will sustain that life throughout all eternity if we have put our trust in him. Now, the point, as I said behind all of this, is that Jesus is the only way to God. He says in John 14, verse 6, in that closing uh, clause, no one comes to the Father but through me. He is the only way. Now, he alone has done the work necessary to save us. He is the truth. He is the reality behind everything that God has done, everything that he has promised, he is the ultimate truth, and it's only in Jesus Christ that we can receive life, eternal life, forgiveness, spiritual life, and that quality of life that He promises us if we will trust in Him. That makes Jesus the only door, the only door to heaven. If you would enter into heaven, you must enter through Him. There is no other way. Now again, what does that say about those who try to get into heaven in other ways? Well, it tells them that they're in danger, right? Now again, there's, there's many different ways. And let me just give a few examples. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? Now again, we're not trying to pick on them. We're trying to point out their errors so that they might live and not die. What about Jehovah's Witnesses who really are not trusting in the Jesus of the Bible, and they're not trusting really in the Jesus they believe in in order to get them into heaven, but they're trusting in their membership in their organization and the work that they do going door to door to get into the paradise on earth that they believe the Lord is going to create in the future? What about them? What about the Mormons that believe that they, if they very scrupulously follow the teachings of Joseph Smith and you know, do the works, their, their two-year mission, and propagate the Mormon faith, and then they marry in the Mormon temple, and, uh, you know, what are they expecting? They, well, they're expecting that they will advance to a state of godhood. What about those who believe those kinds of things? What about Muslims who believe that by following the teachings of, of Muhammad that they're going to end up in a paradise, and in their view, a sensual paradise, in heaven? What about the majority of the human race that believe that if there is a heaven and a hell, that they're going to go to the good place because their good works are going to outweigh their bad works, and that's going to get them into the good place and keep them out of the bad? You know, what about them? What about the people who attend church from week to week who believe that what God says in the Bible is true? who believe that the gospel is the only way, but who have never really trusted Jesus, turned from their sins, and devoted their lives to Him. And what about those, and here's another group that go to church from a week-to-week -week basis, who believe that they've trusted Him, but who are constantly afraid that they haven't done enough, not quite good enough, they haven't quite done enough works to get into heaven, I believe Jesus is the way. I've trusted Him, but I know He wants me to do these things. I've got to be good enough to enter into heaven. And what about my sins? I'm, I'm so bad that my sins surely will condemn me. In other words, 
they're not just trusting Jesus Christ, but they're also looking to their works to be good enough to enter into heaven. They're trusting their works, Christ and their works. Well, the answer to all these questions is the same in each case. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Whoever does not come through Jesus, through faith in His name, through a complete trust in Him, in His work to save them, through repentance from all of their sins, whoever doesn't come in this way, Jesus says, will not enter into heaven. In other words, if they don't come trusting in Jesus Christ alone and <clears throat> showing the evidence that they have trusted Him in a life of repentance and obedience to Him. Now, we, we should consider, as we think about this, <clears throat> that there's many people we know who are in at least one of these situations. I tried to kind of paint it broadly. We know there's many other people, many other ways people are painting, many other interpretations of the Bible, many other inter people claiming to be Christ, people claiming, you know, to break us out of this darkness that we're in and eventually get to a better place that have nothing to do with Christ. We know people who are in these situations. What should we do about it? Well, we should pray that the Lord might show us how to reach them with the gospel because there is only one way to heaven. Everybody who looks in another direction is ultimately going to be lost. Again, that illustration of the, the wheel with the many spokes, as it were, that lead to the one hub and that belief that is very prevalent today that... There's only one God, but, you know, the people who um, are of this religion believe in the same God as this religion, the same God that we believe in, and all these different spokes lead to the same hub. There's only one spoke that leads to one hub that is true. All the rest of them are false ways, and they're all scattered out in other directions. It's not going to lead them to God. They need to hear the gospel. That's why we do missions. That's why the Lord tells us to evangelize because they need to hear this message. Think again about what the Father put His Son through on the cross. Would He allow people to come to Him in another way if, I mean, would He have put His, his Son to death on the cross and to go through that excruciating pain, taking our sins and, and suffering the wrath of God if He was going to allow people to come any way they wanted to? No, we can't circumvent Christ. He is the only way. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. Remember in the garden when he prayed, Father, if it's possible, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, and that was the cup of his wrath that he had to drink down, the one that as he thought about, he sweat blood over. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. If this, if I must drink it, then give me the grace to drink it so that your people and my people might be saved. There was no other way Jesus had to drink that cup. He is the only way to God. We need to pray for those who don't believe that and haven't heard that and seek to reach them with the gospel. And we need to think about ourselves as well, don't we? We need to make sure that we are trusting in the right way to heaven, that we have gone through the only door, the right door. Now, of the categories I've mentioned, we're more likely to fall into these last two than any of the others. So this exhorts us to make sure that we have closed with Christ, that we're trusting Him for our salvation and not ourselves, that we are turning from our sins. In other words, we need to make sure that we're not just believing the facts, but that we actually are trusting Jesus, that we really do love Him. That's the evidence that we're trusting Jesus is that we have a genuine love for Him. We want to follow Him. We want to do His will. We don't want to do those things that dishonor Him <clears throat> because we love Him and because we find that who and what He is is beautiful. So let's make sure that we are trusting Him. And secondly, let's make sure that we are trusting Him alone for our salvation. Make sure that you're looking to Jesus alone and to His works and not to your works. Basically, Salvation is by grace alone, which means it's by His work alone, and it's received by faith alone, by looking to Him and receiving salvation as a free gift, 
without any work on your part. Now, this is really the only way that you can really have any assurance. Remember how Jesus said this morning to his disciples, and he says this to us as well, if we have trusted him, you know, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it wasn't so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. How can you know that that actually applies to you? Well, there's only way that you, one way that you can, and that is if your salvation is based on the work of Jesus Christ alone, because if it is in any way based on your work, you could never know that you would be there. You could never know there was a place that it is prepared for you in heaven or that you would ever be there or that Jesus would ever come for you either at his second coming or with his angels to take you there unless it is based on a work that is absolutely infallible and unshakable and one that is absolutely certain. But that's exactly what the gospel is all about. You are not to trust your works in any way. Paul reminds us on another occasion if it is by Grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. And he tells the Galatians when he says, you know, you've listened to these people who have come and have taught you that you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. He says, "You've, you've fallen from grace if you believe that, which means you're now trusting in Jesus plus the circumcision to save you. You need to trust in Jesus alone. That's the only way that there could be assurance and it's the only way that you can have the assurance that you will see heaven. And that is if your trust is in Jesus Christ alone. So Jesus reminds all of us this evening that He is the way, that He is the truth, and He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. That's the way that we must come. But if we have come through Him, if we've come again through faith alone in His name, We are saved. Jesus has prepared a place for us in heaven. He will come and receive us again, and we can know that with absolute certainty. I hope that you know that this evening for yourself because you've trusted in Jesus. If you haven't, then I would urge you to trust in Him now. Let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us to trust Him and to rely on Him alone.